All right, so you have your iPads, you're gone now. Have this written down because this is going to be your homework for the week. Yes, no. Don't just take a picture of it. Like, actually, really? I this will, this is, will be online, huh? I always see you guys do that. You're like, we'll take pictures. The whole point of writing it is that you can, like, you know, put it in your brain. Typing doesn't really do Oh, the sub? It does something similar. It's not as good as writing it down with like your hand, but. Um, like pages. Don't call me. Why are we still in What is this? <laughs> what is this? I do not, I do not <laughs> convey <laughs> justice to you. Mr. Parks, thank you. Just in case. What? Just in case. It was a. Uh, it was a. Uh, it was Madonna Calabria. Uh, Madonna? Madonna. Madonna. She's from Egypt. That's why she gave me these. Her grandma. Okay. Whoa, when did she graduate? Oh, Better to leave that. That's disgusting. Those are real ads. Those are real. What's your name? Madonna. I just said it. It's like Madonna. Is it Madonna? What's her last name? It's like Madonna. What's her last name? This is the chapter in the Theory of Knowledge textbook entitled Mathematics, Knowing, or the Knowing of Mathematics. Huh? Okay, so you think that I need to like give that away to somebody? Okay, well, you're probably right. Maybe I need to do that. No, so, teams one through three do Albert Einstein, and four through six do Kurt Godel. Uh, you might not have heard as much about Godel or Goidel. Goidel is a German, I don't know. Huh? Who does? Is that how it's supposed to be? Who does? I don't know. I think that's there's like there's like two what are those things called above the German O? Oh, the little doctor. There's those things, and I don't have them there, so I don't know if that means the label. Like a Goyer? I think it's Einstein. I think it's Cologne. It's spelled with the two dots. Holm. Holm. Oh, it's. K O K O L N is in the one. Yeah, and then two dots. Yeah, so it's like, so you're probably right. Godel. Godel. I don't know. I'm not German. So ask a German person. All right. Uh, this should not say historical method. That should say mathematics. So. That's a, I just saw that. It's, it's, and we're not in week 9, it's week 10. The one thing on this whole slide that I did not change is the actual title. Really so. hard. <laughs> no. <I shut> up. <laughs> Whatever. The night before. <laughs> no, this was not the night before. I swear. I, now, this is going to be, I'll just say this right now. We are entering into the theory of knowledge curriculum to which I am like Alice in Wonderland. I'm kind of like, oh, mathematics for me is the same as ma is magicians, magical knowing. Just, just hello. Hello. <laughs> We, we went from those areas of knowing that I kind of know a lot more about, I feel more an expert in, and then <laughs> getting into math, getting into science, it's going to be like, not, not so much. So, I, I will totally appreciate, thank you, I'll totally appreciate any help I can have on this. Alright, if you are team six, you are doing a brief history of mathematics, it's a podcast. I suggest, it's only about eight minutes long. I suggest everybody read or listen to it, and the people on Team Six can like um, give us the information, the important the information for the rest of us to write down next week. Hmm? That will be the link at the bottom. I'm not sorry, from blue here, you're not going to see it. Because I can't figure out how to change the color. Huh? That's a lot. And these are the philosopher portraits: Albert Einstein or Kurt Gödel. No, Teams one to three do Albert Einstein. You weren't listening too good. Uh, I was, I and was really focusing. I bet you were. And then Kurt Gödel is three, three through six. Your argued out is on climate change. Again, climate. Our argued outs, remember, are loosely connected with our area of knowing for the week. So you are kind of using that lens that we are considering with the subject. So something about mathematics and something about climate change connect them together. You can also incorporate other areas of knowing, as we always tend to do in TOK. Nothing is within uh, itself. Now, this is a picture of me here. This is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yeah, my god arrow, and I was, you know, so dark. 
Mind freak. You know these guys are so natural. Curse angels float around. <laughs> so fake, right? It's so fake. Okay, listen now. No. Because it's totally real. Look at this. Including this nice lens flare right here. It's actually producing that. Sean! Sean, Sean's kind of has to be right. Mind freak. I'm like a I'm going to read your mind, okay? So first I'd like you to uh, to pick a three-digit number. Any any number, make sure you're different from everyone else in the room. Or at least the people around you, so that you're not colluding to try and help me with my amazing mind powers. And I learned about this like 10 minutes ago, so. It's like divided by 10. Shut up. Do not ruin the mystery. Do not ruin the mystery So to the three-digit number, the only thing is, Three-digit number cannot be what are those called when they can go backwards and forwards, so they can't be like oh, yeah. palindromes. Yeah, palindromes can't be a numerical palindrome. Wow, it so can't be like two thirty-two, so it has to be different going another way. You can't say rules. There's no rules on my. No, it has to be all different numbers. Yeah, so like one thirty-two is a great number. Six six six. This is not Ryan. It's, it's a form of mind reading. Be quiet. You don't Quiet, understand. Shut up. <laughs> take, don't know my life. Just take in the magic. Uh, okay, so we have those three digit numbers. And. Okay, now I'm trying to remember the next step here. Hey. I like how I'm called the next step. You're supposed to just be able to read our minds. That was supposed to be step. Yeah, now you're gonna, now you're gonna take. The reverse of that number, and you're going to get the difference with the higher number on top. So whatever that number is. Yeah, calculator. Yeah, calculator. What? Yeah. calculator to do this? Friggin' right three yeah. digit subtraction. Yeah. Not doing any like special parabola. Yeah. Reverse the number. <laughs> Whatever the higher number is, the larger number that goes on top. So it's a, always it's not a negative number basically. Yeah. You're, you're doing the difference. Do we all know what difference is? No. Um, <laughs> the difference is. <laughs> no, it's not. It can't possibly be. Now, now you're going to take. Be quiet. Now you're going to take the reverse of that number and. Add them together. Now, if the number is only two digits at this point, you need to add a zero in front of for the third placeholder. Wait, wait, wait. Repeat that. It's impossible. You did a palindrome. From what number? Uh, okay, so for your difference, the difference that you created, that's your subtraction of your two numbers, one reverse. Now you're going to take that new number, reverse that, and add them together. Uh, add what together? What is that? Add the new number and with the reverse of the new number together. Uh, now, if your number happened, let's say your number is 99 because it was a, re a reducing of it to I only two digits, you put a 0, 9, 9, <laughs> and you yeah. turn it around. I don't remember, I'm just saying it, just throwing it out. Let's say the number was 82. Mine's a four, yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we all have the number? No. Add a 0 to the end of 99. Zero and then so, so now you need to add a zero placeholder for the front of it, so it's three digits, and then you do your zero and then whatever the number is, let's say the number is 75. <laughs> zero, zero, 075, and then you add that to 750. You know what I mean? So you, zero, 075, sorry, then you flip it around, 570, whatever that is. Is that easy? Is it easy? Come on. So you're going to just reverse the number. <laughs> Because you're not even doing the number. You're not even, you don't even have your iPad for it. My iPad died. Okay, well, get out a piece of paper. Be not a loser. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Here, here we go. Do we have our number, you guys? This is so many. You guys made a layer for me. I don't know. So, once you get the. <laughs> okay. Okay, fine. Here. Look. Look. Ready? Oh, that's your number. I win. Oh, my God. Right? You did it wrong. That's why. Because I, I, I chose the number that you were supposed to get. 
and but you forgot, so you messed up. I'm sorry. One thousand four hundred and thirteen. Maybe you're just bad at explaining. I think maybe you just don't know what differences are. <laughs> Subtraction. My calculator doesn't know. No, I think you did the rest of you, the rest of you guys got to it. Wow, that was a lame activity. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm, right I'm, right I'm, so sorry. I'm not fit to pretend to be. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so the. I have a math question. No, 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 no. Okay, so. The point, the point of this dumb activity was to show that perhaps math. One of the reasons we do math is to predict things. We can, we can set up a set of axioms and theorems and understand where we're going with stuff. And sometimes we can even predict what um, a set of those, basically what this equation system is, is, no matter what it is that you put in it, given the set of axioms, you're going to get the same conclusion. It was built around this conclusion. Uh, and it's meant to kind of somewhat show the idea that we can actually use math as a way, as a way of knowing and even pr perhaps predictions about how the world will actually behave in the future. You ever think about that? Math is not just something of the past, it can also kind of get us towards something of knowing into the future. Have you guys ever uh, seen, where's this guy at, hold on, there he is, there he is. Uh, have you guys ever seen this guy at all, who is Nate Silver? Uh, oh. He used computer simulations to accurately predict every... Thank you so <laughs> much, yeah, let me clear that back, so we know. okay, so we're assuming, Nate Silver, right, uh, Nate Silver just had this kind of controversy, if you've been looking at the news, which I'm sure you all watch all the time, uh, in which he predicted, based upon uh, using mathematical formula and computer simulation, like I said there, uh, every single state and how it would uh, how it would decide the election. So every single state, he accurately predicted where they were going to go, what the electoral college would do, and so this was a really sort of interesting thing that. We haven't fully explored yet the idea of statistical analysis and probability to determine who's going to be the next president. How have we determined, based upon our prediction cycles, the way in which elections go? How have we done that in the past? Or how do you hear it presented oftentimes? Voting. Well, before voting, what might they start doing as, as people start describing the facts surrounding the ele possible election victories? Yeah, maybe from like, like from the party affiliation. So from the party affiliation, they tend to have their sort of bias involved with, well, of course my candidate's going to win, and so these are the reasons, and these are my polls, and so oftentimes there's polls that are done, and there's these all these different types of data sets that they try and do in order to predict the election, and it was in the mainstream versions of punditry, the the analysis of the presidential election, it turned out. That for them, this election was a 50-50. Of course it would just be this tied race the whole time. It was too close to call. But for Nate Silver, who used mathematical formula and computer simulation, that's all I can describe it as. I don't know anything else about how he did it, which is part of the magic of math for me, because again, I don't know enough about it. But he was actually able to predict accurately not only every state and how it was able to go, but also the fact that uh, President Barack Obama would win with a 90.9% uh, accuracy. So here is this, he's got 90.9% chance of winning the election, according to Nate Silver. And the pundits, the normal people who, of course, are on MSNBC and Fox News, they both get up, up in arms, like, how, how dare you think that you can assume that you can predict how people are going to vote? And yet, what happened? He won. Not only did uh, President o Obama win, but you have this, this intense level of accuracy based upon predictions of mathematical formula. So even though he was ridiculed by how we look at stuff, he's actually, in a lot of ways, in his blog, because he just kind of writes on the internet, his uh, blog sort of blew up after this whole thing and became sort of a, a mini celebrity in his own right. He's changed the way that future s uh, statisticians will look at presidential elections, because you can actually, you can do things probability uh, to develop it. You also heard this key word being thrown around the election. It seems to be a theme that I've 
brought up a few times the, the election since we just had one. It's such an interesting place to go when it comes to logical fallacy and with ethics and with decisions we make militarily or whatever. Uh, there's this thing that was thrown back, back and forth about budgets. And, and one, one side will always kind of accuse the others, hey, it's just what? This isn't my opinion, this is just what? It's just math. This is just math. It's just simple math. You can't do this and do this. You can't do tax cuts and this spending. You can't do this uh, type of healthcare thing and this, that, and the other. So they both were saying to the other, it's just simple math. You heard this key word being used a lot as well. It's just math. Why is it that when we throw out that word, hey, it's math, it's not my opinion, it's math, what does that mean? What are we trying to say? Hmm? When you talk about math, there's this assumption that it does what? Or that it is what? Not just fact, but it's implicitly true. When I say that something is factual or mathematical, we immediately put it in this higher realm of knowing, don't we? So these are all thoughts to have, not only the idea of predicting things based upon probability, but also whether or not math has this real place that it needs. Uh, that it has in our way of knowing. So the question that I had, and I'm going to jump back, sorry about that. Yay, 1089. Uh, is whether or not the, uh, how do we use math to anticipate and predict future quote-unquote knowing? And is math superior in this regard to the other areas of knowledge? Is there ways in which math somehow does better at telling us stuff about the way the world is and will be? I have this picture here in a quote uh, by Lewis Carroll where as she's floating down the rabbit hole, and that was one of my uh, images that I described as we're talking about questions and going into these ideas and realms that are beyond your normal disciplines. Uh, this idea of math seems to underwrite a lot of Lewis Carroll's work. He was actually a mathematician at Christ College, and so one of the themes that literary uh, analyzers, the people who are uh, interested in Alice in Wonderland, they, they often see themes of math involved. And so she's here talking as she's going down the rabbit hole, four times five is 12, and four times six is 13, and four times seven is, oh dear, I shall never get to 20 at that rate. And it seems like nonsense to us, except that the person who is writing this understands that there's bases of math multiplication. So here's, uh, Five is, uh, four times five is 12 in base notation of 13. Don't need to tell, I don't know what that is, but I know that that's what is going on here. So there's some sort of base system that's creating uh, this subset of multiplication that doesn't actually ever get to 20. It'll always just get to 1a, 1b, 1c. It'll just keep going up, but it'll never actually get to 20. And this is a, uh, one of the many things that Lewis Carroll was actually railing against, not only as a as a strong sort of Euclidean uh, mathematician who believed in the, the connection of the world to math. When you start getting outside of that, you can go into all sorts of crazy stuff that doesn't actually have real empirical meaning. And that's part of the reason why he writes Alice in Wonderland the way he does. So much of it is absurd because it's meant to show that what math does when you take it out of the real wor world does all these kind of weird nonsensical so this is one of the many themes that TOK would have to bring up. What is math in the world? Or what is math to our understanding of knowledge? And how does it function in this, uh, in this empir empirical set? So we're going to start with some definitions of philosophy. And then we're going to look at what axioms and theorems are. You've heard of the, what, what's the famous theorem? You're probably the only one that you know off the top of your head. Oh yeah, of course, from Oz. No, I don't know. But that's yours? I don't know. I wish I knew. But that green is what I know. But what do you guys know? Descartes? Descartes, yeah. So the building. But what's, what's, uh, what is it? Fomas? Fermat? What is Fermat's theorem? I don't know either, but I've heard the name too. And Godel has his theorems, they're called incompleteness theorems, that's all I know. Yeah, Pythagorean theorem is the one that I know. <laughs> anyway, so that's the theorem. Then the idea, uh, kind of going backward a little bit after we talk in depth about math in a bit of a historical context, talk about truth versus certainty. How do we have truth on something even though there's certainty? And oftentimes, does math, because we use the terms like, oh, it's just math, this isn't my opinion, it's math. We often use it as a subset of or uh, connected to the idea of certainty. 
And it does it actually do that? Does it actually perform for us? What would you think the answer to that would be? Does math give us certainty? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting argument to be had because at some point there was a time in which, yes, you would say that math had certainty. There was some sort of logical absolute involved with math. 2 plus 2 equals 4. There just seems to be a, not, a, not only an intuitive certainty to that, but also almost based upon these a priori ideas, these absolute certainty that that can't be anything other than what it is based upon our understanding of the language. 2 plus 2 equals 4. It almost goes back to our basic subset of logic, that A cannot be both A and not A at the same time, right? So there's something s seemingly foundational about these things, again, a priori. But we'll look at those a little bit more, and I'll kind of break it down so it's not quite as complex. I'll get, look at some math and culture, so the idea of how does math interact with different cultures. There's different reasons for different people's use of math, and lastly, how it connects to art. How might math connect to art? Proportions. Yeah, proportions. The golden ratio. We have mixing of colors of color. Circumference. You need to learn circumference. Yes, you might need to do some circles in your paintings. That's right. That's just some guy made that up. What? Some guy just made that up. So. Math and art. Let's put it in school. Oh, see, that's, that's, it actually reminds me of a picture I saw over the uh, break where it was like, you can't, what is it, uh, you can't, you can't, you can't, don't, don't believe math, you can't, you can't believe everything that you read in textbooks. Or someone who was trying to be, they were trying to be very like, oh, you can't believe everything you read, but they were saying like, yeah, you don't reject science. Oh, no, it was, I don't believe, oh, that was what it is. It was something like that, but then there was one that was, uh, I don't, I don't believe in dinosaurs. Uh, the bones are not enough evidence for me, or something like that. Their bones are not enough evidence. I'm sorry, I have to be a skeptic. So, I don't know. Just something like that. I was like, oh, really? That's funny. Thank you for that. Okay. Chelsea's being me. She's being way me. I'm going to throw a chair at her. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. All right, you're, ridic you're ridiculous. Okay. Uh, so, what is mathematics? Here's a, here's a kind of a silly definition. There's too many definitions, there's too many different types of definitions to count. Here's what a is simple that? One. Who's playing music? That's, that's the thing. That's Gordon. You're all right. No, right I, I was going to print so now. I, I want to hear it. You don't like hearing music? I like hearing it. It's like a rhythm for me. It's so like, don't talk too fast. <laughs> Mathematics is founded. <laughs> I know, it's like going fast now. It's like, I go on every other beat. How about that? <laughs> Mathematics is founded on a set of more or less universally accepted definitions and basic assumptions. There's a system of axioms. That's the underlying word that you would need to do. Systems of axioms. These, these things that are true in and of themselves. That can't be proved by the system. And this is where Go, uh, Gödel uh, and his incompleteness theorem is important. In 1930s, 1934, he basically proved that you cannot prove... Uh, uh, an infinite set of axioms to the point of true certainty. And so this is generally accepted as the fact that math no longer has the same type of certainty as it once did uh, prior to 1930s uh, in, the, in the history of mathematics. However, so we have these system of axioms, again, even without certainty, we can still have pretty good knowledge of their truth. Again, they can't be proven by the system because that would be what? Trying to prove something by the very system that you're founding it on is called what? Circular, Circular argument, right? It's true because it, it because it says it's true, and that would be a problem. So that's the issue with ex axioms: is their assumptions. There's so many. The, the, there's a set of given assumptions, axioms that various things like geometry, for instance, uh, will like. There's a five set of axioms that are basic truths that you would have to have before math makes any sense. And then later from there, you prove these theorems, these built up systems based upon your axioms of truth. These theorems have a degree of quote unquote certainty and these, this idea of certainty is only developed insofar as the thing cannot be unproved. Meaning, kind of our best way of determining whether an axiom and a theorem are valid arguments or valid formulas is to do what? What are some of the ways that we do that? At least one of the most basic ways. 
let's say I take the Pythagorean theorem. What might be a way that I can prove that it's untrue? Test it. What do you mean, test it? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you want to start giving an example uh, based upon maybe number sets. So start sticking in numbers and seeing if those numbers do the correct thing or maybe relate it to the natural world at some point. Triangles are, we can at least look at, maybe not two dimensional triangles, but we can look at hypotenuses in the world and figure out how it might correspond. So we use a correspondence theory of truth there. We can also then plug in, just like on a graph, we can plug in and figure out what numbers work and what numbers don't. If there's some sort of internal inconsistency, a contradiction, much like a logical fallacy, that, that would disprove it. Now, that's the best we can do normally, is try and disprove something. If we can't disprove it, so long as it's not unproven, we accept it as what? It's valid. So, as, as at least valid up until the point. But that leaves us the level of, well, maybe this will be unproven at some point in the future. Remember, one of my definitions of knowledge was uh, knowledge, uh, you, you know just as much as uh, Oftentimes, what we know is a lot of what we un we unknow, or what we're no longer knowing in the in the future. So we're actually replacing our knowledge. Think about the differences in how physics worked in the 17th century, as opposed to how they do today. What kinds of things, or biology? I mean, there are any of these sciences have had such a great mass and growth of knowledge uh, based upon the evolution of, of knowing. Here's a question: here. Should mathematics be an area or a way of knowing? How is math different from reason? Sounds like when I talk about math and certainty and internal consistency and validity and certainty and truth and a priori axioms, all these things seem to be very similar to reason, don't they? And yet on our IB TOK learner profile, we see the way of knowing and mathematics as being, uh, as being separate. That is, the reason, uh, using reason versus the area of knowing, which is mathematics. So the question is, why might that need to be the case. Here is our uh, knower profile, if you remember how we do this here. Remember, we go from the center as the knower, and then to the outside we have the ways of knowing. We talk about these dotted line, which means these kind of can, can flow in and out of each other, meaning we don't have this subset. There's not a division of the two. But the knower himself is kind of div is separate from his senses in some ways, at least according to this chart. Mathematics is an area of knowing. But how might mathematics be different than reason? What would be the differences between the two? Let's take a guess and kind of start discussing a little bit. What do you think? Mm -hmm. like, no, yes, no. The How might reason is embedded in, like, you have, you like, are born, well, not born with it, but you develop reason on math, you have to, like, learn it. And okay, so reason tends to. It's like. So, did you, you're born understanding, uh, like, well, not born, logical. Well, like, uh, you develop it. Well, math, you have to actually, it's like man made. Like, you, well, it's not. Okay, no, but you're, you're touching on, I think, a tension that is in math. Is, is, is math, this is one of the subsets in the, uh, the textbook too, is math discovered or is math invented? And that, I think that's kind of something that you're yeah. suggesting here. It's definitely invented, right? Or is it discovered? Definitely. Are we discovering something that actually does exist independently of the knower? So we use the tape in So, so maybe there. If it was probably. discovered, then um, there's. Like, what, what might be the per let's go to coach. Do you have something that you're... I was just going to say that. Amen. Based on the reason that uh, you can see the golden ratio in nature. Okay, so. so you can so that, it's, it's that it's discovered or invented is what you're... Discovered. So it's discovered. So when we see things in nature, I pick up a pine cone and I can start uh, collecting some sort of data, maybe how the spiral operates, how many of the uh, pine cone needles are inside the, the cone. And I can start seeing that over and over again in every single cone, no matter where the cone is, and I start developing a sequence of, of knowing based upon that pine cone, I can actually create a subset, like a pyramid, that's called the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the golden ratio, is this idea of the spiral does something, and we see it everywhere. We see this in the seashell. And that's actually my last slide about art and, and beauty and that sort of thing. But yeah, so it seems to us that there might be a discovery going on. That we see it in the world, and therefore we're overlaying language onto what we see in the world. How might that be different than reason as a pure thing? Because I think you're, uh, we're onto something here. Invention versus discovery, reason versus mathematics in some ways. Maybe yes? 
know, any of these like reason to discover that stuff? Would the mathematics involve the event to um, kind of like make it concrete and usable? Like, actual yeah, I think I think where we might go with the difference between the two is that reason is a a the way in which we are doing it, meaning this these sets of proofs or these sets of true statements a priori things, and that in order to do mathematics, we have to apply this area, this way of knowing, that is reason, to our language, and when you're talking about concrete stuff, so that we can apply it in the world, or do something with it, or there's a body of evidence and a history involved. So there's a history of how we talk about mathematics, just as much as there's a history of reason, but it seems to be a concrete set of systems. And the two definitely interplay, in fact, you can maybe, even if you wanted to, bring this reason over, maybe have them almost kind of connected together if you wanted to add to this system. Because the two are very, very linked. Much more so than probably emotion in mathematics, wouldn't you say? Or do people get really excited when they see an asymptote? <laughs> We're just talking about Mr. Ren getting excited about asymptotes. The asymptote just keeps getting closer and closer, but it'll never get there. What is that kind of tension? It's like a tension involved. He really can't like it. He gets, he, gets, he gets excited about it. People might see beautiful formulas and things like that. I mean, if I get it right, I get really emotional. There you go. So, <laughs> you get all excited. You're like, it took me forever. Any one of these, though, you can do the way of knowing it. It seems to be that. Reason and math have a special relationship. All right, next slide here. Go ahead and start taking some notes here as we talk. Make sure that you are not just uh, being passive listeners. When we look at math, this is going directly to our <coughs> idea of whether or not it's an area of knowing or a way of knowing mathematics. Because throughout time, throughout history of philosophy, there's been different and competing theories about how math ultimately works in the world and what it does. If you're to look at somebody like Newton, for instance, as he's developing his uh, principles of mathematics connected to physics, you would see that for Newton, this was developing a language, this objective language about how the world operates. And so as such, math is the language of the world or the universe. It's God's language, and Newton was... Uh, as himself, a religious individual, he's believing that there is, in fact, consistency, in fact, a language that underrides the systems that we see in the world. Along with that, there's lots of other thinkers that we'll talk about in a moment, including a guy named uh, uh, Leibniz, Gottfried Leibniz, who will continue that thought, but make it even more intense. That is, that at some point, we might actually get rid of all of the language that we normally use. You, you talked about loving English because it seems to be so you know, organic. <laughs> it's, it's the in-between. It's what you didn't say that was interesting, right? Huh? English seems to be so subjective or something along those lines. It makes it easy for you to get a good grade because we often talk about it, especially as AP students, like, oh, man, I BS that, and you get a good grade on it. It's not that you BS did, you just think you did because you're so smart. You know, that's the, that's the thing. And then English, <laughs> that's the real reason. And then English has all these different answers involved. Whereas math seems to be very like German. It's very like right or wrong. It's very German about that. Um, yeah. So, with, with math, then it seems to be, according to uh, philosophers of like, for instance, the Enlightenment era, that you would eventually at some point get to a place where we were not even talking in English. You would be using just mathematical formula because we would have so much knowledge of math that it would eventually end our pursuit of knowledge because we'd know everything. You hear this sometimes uh, described today as the theory of everything. We want to get to the theory of everything. And there's this, uh, this hopeful pursuit that science or math are going to literally prove everything and that there won't be any more body. There'll be a finite limit to the question. And the question there is, that, is that a philosophical framework? that makes sense. And so for Kant, he comes after Leibniz and is critiquing both Leibniz and Newton about whether or not math can do things in the world. And so Kant believes that you can, in fact, only know things through the use of reason, pure reason, and these ideas that math can be 
purely logical, meaning these a priori synthetic knowledge, that math is a real thing, and that it can really tell us real stuff about the real world. That's what synthetic means. Synthetic knowledge means it's something about the real world. And there's all sorts of assumptions here that I can't go into, things about how time and space work, for instance, that time and space, according to Kant, were attributes, not real things. So for, for Kant, it's like space, it's like you take up space uh, as an attribute of yourself, but you're not, it's not actually a unit of something itself. So the same with time. Time is an attribute. It is 6 o'clock, but there's no 6 o'clock floating around someplace. Or that, it, or it has weight or gravity. It's not a thing. It's just a measurement or some sort of attribute. So this all goes back to Aristotle and Socrates and, and the use of accidents versus essence and that sort of thing. But basically the bottom line is with Kant, he's believing you can in fact get to this purely logical basis for synthetic knowledge. Now, the question here is how can math give us knowledge of the thing itself, what Kant would call the ding on, on sick, which is the thing in and of itself. Kant would believe the closest way to do that, you can never fully do that, but you can do, get really close to doing it with math and with reason. And that these are the areas in which we do stuff uh, as philosophers. Now, of course, what I said here is that space and time are forms for our intuition, not the thing itself. So meaning it's something that we use to help us understand uh, the attributes around us. Space is an attribute, not a thing. Time is an attribute, not a thing. Now, what, uh, what might cause Kant's uh, system of pure logical sort of objectivity to go and to cause doubt about this sort of system of how wonderfully certain math is? But there's counterexamples. What do you like? Maybe just in general, there might be some counterexamples. Like if one or, like someone disproves one of his theories. Or... Yeah, that would be definitely the way in which we would go about figuring out whether Kant or Leibniz or, or Newton are correct in their assertions about how math operates. That would be the way to do that. And who did that? Who 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 changed the from the Newtonian era to the to the next era after? Maybe I'm maybe I'm being too specific. Is one of your Einsteinians, so the Einsteinian sort of paradigm on how the world works. So, um, and I'll just skip through that real quick because this is going to get us confused because I already said this here. So here's here's how Einstein 